Uh, I'm going to start by looking at functoriality of the category of incoherent sheaves. So, functors on incoherent sheaves. And I'm going to assume that Z is a nice scheme but probably not necessarily an, an affine one. So maybe quasi-compact of almost finite type in the sense that was explained last time. So I'll just say just generally nice scheme. If you, at this point it doesn't really matter whether it's a DG scheme or an actual scheme. So the questions are already interested in the classical setup. Okay, so a short summary of what, <coughs> of uh, <coughs> the operations somehow, these are not the only operations, but the most important ones that involve these incoherent sheaves um, is that, well, if, when there is a uh, morphism between two schemes, there are two functors between uh, the categories of incoherent sheaves, so there's a functor of direct image, or more precisely, the star direct image, and the pullback in the incoherent world is the extraordinary pullback, the shriek pullback. So it, which goes in the opposite direction. And I guess one can say that uh, w at least one motivation for even introduction of this, for thinking about this incoherent um, category as a nice geometric object is that, well, this functor is sometimes important. This is what somehow the duality theory on uh, <coughs> schemes is all about. And it turns out that if you want this functor to have nice properties, like you want it to be uh, a continuous functor, you have to work with this category. So this is the category where the Shriek pullback naturally leads. The anything you see in the quasi-coherent category is somehow, um, well, more of a mirage. Of finite no, that's that's somehow the point. If it were of tiny tor dimension, then it's, there's no problem with this on, on quasi-coherent uh, story. Also, if it's of finite tor dimension, then this functor would be easier to understand because it would just send coherent sheaves to coherent sheaves, and so then you can just end uh, extend. Now, one thing is that in order to distinguish, so the uh, Shriek pullback only exists in the incoherent world unless the morphism is, has finite tor dimension, but this guy exists in both incoherent and quasi-coherent world, so I'll, there's an upper index to make sure the two are not confused in a situation where confusion is likely. And so, <coughs> sorry? What's the assumption on it? Well, I mean, if schemes are nice enough, then no assumptions. And if you want to deal with stacks, then for this one, you would have to assume something like schematic morphism. Mm -hmm. For what? Well, I normally, th if you think with Netherian, I mean, you might run into troubles with this one, just like in usual duality theory. And you know, you usually have to assume that something like dualizing sheaf exists. So normally we work with quasi, uh, with um, fine, something of finite type over a field and quasi compact. Right, and then there are no, then the, as we know from standard duality theory, somehow things work. So anyway, and so the definition of these functors uh, was, uh, let me actually finish the summary. This is, these are the two functors and then there's somehow uh, an important but um, easier thing is that if you just have a single scheme Z, then there's a tensor product between quasi-coherent sheaves and incoherent sheaves. So there's a tensor product. I could have put the tensor product of categories, I guess. So into int core of z. 
So, so this is an action of the monoidal category. I won't actually talk much about it, but it, once you actually start working, it's of course nice to have some kind of tensor product. So actually, this is a tensor product of categories, right? You could, yeah, it's, it's a bilinear in the sense that was explained, so I could put, put it like this. So. And also, there's the tensor product on int core itself. Just yes. The yes. There is a tensor product on int core itself defined using this pullback. And um, like the Shriek tensor product on int core. But again, I, I'm more or less, I'll just put the most famous tensor product on the board and be done with this. Okay, and just quickly, for example, let's say we want to define this functor. The definition was uh, given last time, but uh, I, I want to say that it's something really simple, especially if you remember that there are two ways of thinking about int core. On the one hand, those are inductive limits of coherent shifts. On the other hand, they are objects are completely identified once you know homomorphisms from coherent shifts into those. So that means that, for example, to define this functor, so define, to define this one, it's enough uh, to say what, what it does applied to a coherent sheaf. And uh, in fact, now I need, so this is uh, because anything here is an inductive limit of coherent shifts. But now in order to describe this, it's enough to tell what maps from a coherent test object into it look like. And so, ah, oh yeah. Sorry, it's got too classical. So, yes, yeah, so I need to define this as a, in the right sense, so I need to define this as as a groupoid, and then I, in fact I need to define it as a functor from this DG. Well, I guess I, I, it, it's a actually a, com a complex of vector space, so I need to define it as an exact functor from Koch. So there are some details, but I want to say that essentially the whole point is just to describe this, what could be called as pairing between F and G, in, between coherent sheaves on one side and coherent sheaves on the other side, and we just define this to be the same thing in, uh, um, in the quasi-coherent field. So, so this is um, there is somehow some kind of extension or translation from uh, the uh, that allows us to define this functor. And in some sense, I almost want to say, okay, I'm happy that Dennis is uh, not, uh, well, I'm afraid, Nick, can you <laughs> turn away for a moment? <laughs> I almost want to say that for the Shriek, you could, it's basically the same story, but the problem is that Shriek, for the, somehow the classical Shriek is not a very well behaved object. That's the whole reason for working with this. So on the one hand, we understand, I mean, if you read say, Harchon book on residues and dualities, it tells you how to construct shriek of, at least of definitely of a coherent sheaf. So in some sense, we can now play the same game. Now the problem is that we need to define somehow, in order to do the same thing for shriek, we would need to define this object in a very canonical way. So we need to make sure that it has all the right functorialities. And so in some sense, it's easier to uh, it doesn't formally follow from what's from uh, what done in Hartshorn book, for instance, because Hartshorn works with derived categories in the triangulated sense, and that's not enough. So here you really need to work with the G category. So in some sense, you have to redo a lot of classical um, classical theory in this set. No, it does this. Okay. I just don't want to make it seem like. 
<coughs> this is uh, too easy. Somehow the idea is easy if you believe that what's written in Hartshorn's book is easy. And, uh, but, but it's a long book. Okay, so does it make sense? There are well, adjunction properties only happen sometimes. So that's not <laughs> Okay, no, I just as long as it's not a fire alarm or something like this, I guess it's too quiet for this. So somehow one way to say it is that these are what, what might be called the, uh, <coughs> so, what, what was I going to say? The hypothesis actually is not uh, dependent on what is written in the book, right? Well, it depends, I guess. Maybe I have a different uh, idea of what's, well, I mean, you, you have to define it somehow. Yes, but, but it is done independently. Uh, in what? What in what in what setup in coherent world in the, like classical setup? No, no, no. I mean, you are doing this. Uh, uh, Dennis is doing this. Yes. Sometimes. Yes, it's no. done independently. No, I mean it's not doesn't. But I'm saying you that it's. Uh, book, I understand. Right. <laughs> I'm saying that it's the question of the same. It's uh, it, in in some sense you can say that the goal is to uh, update Hartshorn book using. <coughs> Uh, the G language, but it's not non-trivial, no. highly non-trivial question. Yes. Uh, no, but the problem is that categories. the definition of F upper shake normally depends on some extra data. Like you would have to write, your, uh, you can define it easy separately, say for smooth maps and for closed embeddings, and then you have to you can write anything as a composition of those, and then you have to prove that your definition does not depend on the decomposition. And proving that things are independent of a composition amounts to writing some formula. So this is really what uh, we've been warned <laughs> about uh, yesterday. So this is like writing some formula and then proving that the result actually is independent of anything. So like providing some kind of canonical identification between things. So this is a much more subtle question in the uh, in this infinity or the G world. But the, the Hartshorn book becomes much simpler if you use this structure so that you do like a few things in the beginning and compose them with other domains. But it, that's not enough. I mean, the first of all, I don't think the dualizing sheaf actually. Yes, I don't think that's, that works generally. Yes, that's, no, but I mean, the question is you can you, you no, try you using a different T structure. But you should do everything carefully, but only in the fine case, because the rest goes automatically from the clock. Yes, but you have to make sure that the, you, you have to make sure that you don't need, again, what happened yesterday, you don't need a general quasi-compact case to treat the fine to case. The fine yes. case yes. yes. But is, is it true or not? That you need the but general? I think it's actually it helps to have it because in if the map is uh, proper, then this is supposed to, these functors are supposed to be adjoined to each other, and then you can use one to define the other. Yes, but that, that, uh, that's a different question. The construction could be the joint. Uh, no, but I think that this is the definition that you use this as a you, you, def you uh, This is one of the things that uh, again this appeared last uh, yesterday that in the G world. Generally, construction is is a problem. However, uh, there are certain constructions that uh, that were done for you uh, in general settings, and one of those is the construction of a, a joint functor. So, the, if you you can use this adjunction to uh, to construct a upper shake. Exactly. That's that's why it's not a non-trivial question.
Well, first of all, in the derived world, it, that's not going to work, period, because it's not even supposed to line the T, even structure shift does not line any T structure, because it's not, it's not in a single cohomological degree. Oh, so, yeah, no, so, so that yeah, falls yeah. apart immediately, yeah, yes. Okay, so so, so schemes not for digits well, for well, constructions. Well, it's I mean I mean, it's a common knowledge that uh, classical theory is not very generally very well written, and one cannot rely upon everything. One should yes. be careful. To what extent now the situation is, uh, <laughs> has uh, become yeah, better? The blue book is coming. <laughs> okay. It was, it was green yesterday. <laughs> it's <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. And um, anyway, and the tensor product is just comes from action of perfect guys on coherent sheaves. So let me leave this. So so these are the functors, and now. This, these work for any nice schemes, but now let's assume that everything is a locally complete intersection so that we can talk about singular support. Somehow the point is that singular support has nice functoriality with respect to these uh, operations. So let now f, it's still a morphism. Of, well, I might as well assume that there complete intersections. And at this point, maybe I, technically I have to assume that they are affine because that's when I defined a singular support. Um, now let's, I, mean, I don't think there's any harm in adding this condition now, although eventually we want to drop it. So, let me first consider some simple examples that are nonetheless maybe, maybe the most important example is also the simplest one when this map F is smooth. <coughs> now the reason it's the simplest example is because singular support of sheaves is supposed to lie in this right hand side that denoted yeah, smooth, 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 well in, uh, I mean, w w is the question about quasi-compactness or, I mean, the g s g genus on? Yes, yes, the question is about the genus. Yes, no, I mean, it means that, uh, so if you do a base change to a real, s to an actual scheme, the f will it will be an actual scheme, yes, and, and smooth over. So somehow for, s uh, say, if you have an individual scheme rather than a morphism, smooth in particular implies that it's classical and not the g. So here you have a relative version, so these guys can be DG, but the fibers have to be normal schemes, smooth normals. So, in, so the situation is easier in this case because this right-hand side is really somehow <laughs> measures, it's, there's a reason to denote it sing because it measures the singularity of these guys and somehow the notion of singularities should not <coughs> should be local in smooth topology. If you add some extra smooth variables, uh, they don't really affect this um, shifted cotangent bundle. They affect the actual cotangent bundle, the zeroth term of the cotangent bundle, but not the shifted one. And so the precise statement is that sing of z1 will actually be just the base change. Sorry, it's sing z2 times uh, z1 with z2. So it's this shifted cotangent bundle just changes basis. Um, so then this happens. And so now I can, s I don't know if I should still denote this map. I guess if this map is just the first projection. And somehow again by the same uh, somehow, again, the point is that smoothness does not interfere with, non with these singular support operations. So uh, precisely, if you have an incoherent sheaf on Z2, you can lift it to Z1, 
and its singular support will just pull back. So it's the singular support is just pre-image. Okay. So it's in, because it's a smooth morphism, you can actually even talk about f upper star in incoherent world, but they don't differ by much anyways. So it's not. Mm. So in this is, it's like. Um, Remember, there was this question that if a mo morphism has finite tor dimension, then f upper shriek also exists in quasi-coherent world. Similarly, in this set, in if it's finite tor dimension, f upper star also exists in incoherent world. But they differ by something. They differ by something which does not affect singular. They differ by, like by, by a line. So, but that means they localism. So, th th this does not affect. Um, singular support. So let me state it for incoherent sheaves. But if you want, you can also state it for coherent sheaves. So for any f, let me, I, I said I will state it for incoherent sheaves. <laughs> so the singular support of its pullback is the pre-image of the singular support of f. I guess I can just write it like this. And, and that's not a hard, that, that's a re relatively easy exercise somehow. The point is that the, if you uh, write this ex all explicitly as complete intersections, then the cohomological operations upstairs will be the pullbacks of the cohomological operations downstairs. So the cohomological operations are uh, this is compatible. This is for smooth maps. No, no, no. It's, this is only for, so this is only in this example. So f is smooth. But in fact, we can relax this condition a little bit. Namely, we can consider the case where the map f itself is a local complete intersection. Maybe in the jig sense, so I can, should call it quasi-smooth. So uh, generalization suppose f is LCI, or if you want, to, or in the G world, I should call it quasi-smooth. So then. It's no longer true, so we, because we are adding some new local complete intersectionness to this scheme. It's no longer this equality will no longer holds. However, there will be an embedding. So the right hand side will embed into the left hand side. So then this thing z1 actually. So this is. The precise way of saying that we are adding some extra local complete intersections things to f, but not removing anything. So it got more, it got somehow farther from being smooth than z2 was. <coughs> so this map is an embedding, and then I claim that the same formula still holds. And the same formula holds. So the difference is that now this, this means in particular that the singular support of pullback will always be contained in this in the image of this. So a simple example is if you have any locally complete intersection. So if you have any z, you can consider a map to a point, and this its fiber is z, so it's easy to believe that that's a local. The map is local complete intersection, and then the uh, pullback of. Well, I'm talking now. I'm starting to regret taking shriek pullback, but I don't regret it too much. So uh, this is actually going to be the dualizing. Uh, sheaf on Z, 
And I'm saying dualizing sheaf, but in fact it's a dualizing line bundle because Z is a complete intersection. So in this complete intersection world, uh, I mean everything is Gorenstein. So this thing is a line bundle, well I guess technically up to a shift. Shifted line bundle. In particular, it is perfect. So, so this is actually in perf of Z. So its singular support is the zero section. And it is consistent with this formula. So we had the singular support, the sing of a point was just zero vector space. And this embedding is the embedding of the zero section into <coughs> sing z1. So this is sing z embedding of the zero section. Okay, now in general, so this, this is almost already sufficiently close to the general case that you can somehow guess what the general pattern is going to be. So, uh, but it's not easy to guess them. So the... I don't think I explained it. Well, I mean... So in down-to-earth terms, you take something, you take a smooth morphism, and then you impose a bunch of relations. Right? So you, I mean, you take a morphism, take its total space, and then cut out something in the total space by a bunch of equations locally. And the and the local complete intersection. Yes. I think that's the right, it's not necessarily somehow the most convenient definition. You can, just like for the smooth morphism, you can say that a morphism is smooth if the relative uh, cotangent bundle is, sits in, has, has tor amplitude zero. This is really like saying that the relative cotangent bundle has tor amplitude zero minus one. So that's, this is, there are better ways of saying it, but in down to earth terms, it's what I said at the beginning. Okay. And so, so in general, I mean, somehow the mess here is that the singular support lies in this shifted cotangent bundle, and cotangent bundle, doesn't matter whether it's shifted or the regular cotangent bundle, it's not functorial in the obvious way. You don't have a map between, you, a map F does not induce map between shifted cotangent bundles, rather it induces some kind of correspondence, so generally, F will induce, there are two shifted cotangent bundles and the map goes in this. Uh, so there are uh, two maps like this. So this is the projection and this uh, could be thought of as some kind of shifted a differential or co-differential of f. So I'll just denote it sing f, but this is really the derived version of the derivative of f. Derived version of the derivative is actually <coughs> the thing to say. Anyway. <laughs> no, it's, it's like the other derivative of the first derivative. But, um, Yes. Uh, why is that that the same formula holds? You mean that the singular support of the full time is equal to? Yes. And is that obvious? No. Uh, but I don't know if it was obvious for the first. So did you believe my proof in the first? If you believe that, then you can probably come up with something here. So what happens is that we are adding some extra cohomological operators, but they will act basically as zero on this pre-image. So, so they will not. So even though there are some new cohomological operators, the, the singular support in those doesn't live in those directions. It only leaves. So this implies that it's full back perfect for F. Right? Uh, yes, but uh, that's yeah. clear kind of. 
again, in this case, the star pullback is not that different from a sh uh, the shriek pullback and the star pullback more or less coincides, and the star pullback does pull back to affect to perfect. By the way, oh, let me finish. Um, <coughs> So, uh, and so you have this kind of diagram, and the point is that uh, now the singular support is going to be functorial. The functoriality properties of singular support will be defined using this correspondence. So you have to take the image of a subset using the correspondence, and you have to take, well, either go in one way or go in the other way. So the theorem, I'll just state it as a single uh, result, even though the, it will include both pull back and push forward <coughs> is that if you have f sitting in int coherent sheaves on z2 then the singular support of the pullback of f is contained in well I guess I should take the closure at some point so it's contained in no, there's a singular support here, and we just travel along this diagram. So what should I say? It's like this, this inverse projection of singular support uh, of f and closure. So essentially, there's only one reasonable thing you can write on the right, and that's what I'm doing. And similarly for f. Sing f is this map. Yes, I'm taking. Start, start with a set here. Take its pre-image. Then pr minus one sing support of f. This is a set. Is These two are maps. Is there any symbol between seeing F and projecting F? Parenthesis. Better? OK. But I mean, there should be some definition about priorities of operations. <laughs> OK, anyway. So, and conversely, when you take, or if you try travel in, in the opposite direction and take this push forward of F, it's the same story exactly. So it's now only you have you have to apply the two maps in the opposite. So what am I supposed to have another pair of parentheses? Okay. And No, I have no assumptions on anything here. But uh, I said that this is uh, somehow an extension of these results. And that's a bit of a cheating, because here I had actually strict equalities. I knew exactly what the singular support is, while in general I can only say where it will lie. But of course, I don't know. Maybe there was some kind of consolation involved, say, in the d computation of direct image. Or maybe that's so. But this is, in, in what sense, I, I think that this is somehow what happens when map is compatible with the structure of complete intersection. I think this is exactly the. But th there are some interesting situations where you can say something stronger. So this is somehow an upper estimate on, oh, I guess I'm, maybe I should be writing singular support here. This is, maybe this is the problem, or one problem. So th this gives an upper estimate on the singular support of an image. Sometimes it's nice to have some kind of a lower estimate, which can come in two flavors. Either you can do it for an individual sheaf, or sometimes you, can be, uh, you might be able to estimate what category a whole bunch of sheaves generate under this 
kind of functors. Now, so there are some deeper theorems in this direction and uh, that tell you that they are more special, meaning that they will require some assumptions on the morphisms. Like, for example, there's something you can say if morphism, uh, so if morphism is proper, you can say something about direct image. If morphism is uh, a local, com if morphism is a closed embedding, you can say something about pullback. So, or if morphism is a fine, I guess you can say something about pullback. So there are some interesting results in this direction. They're very important, but uh, if, if you want to look them up, you, you probably uh, will have to read the paper. So this is, I, I cannot really talk about, uh, discuss it in this talk, but notice also that I'm not saying anything about the singular support of tensor product, which was my forgotten third operation. This is because it's not, uh, the behavior is somehow the least interesting of all. So if you have, so if on Z you have uh, also the claim that singular support of a tensor product. So somehow when you, I'm talking about the tensor product with quasi-coherent sheaves. So, uh, and the point is that anything that's quasi-coherent should not affect the singular support at all. So this will be contained in the singular support uh, of G. So. You can actually cancel the singular support by tensoring it? I mean, it dip when the Th th this is where I would regret. First of all, you, you know, you can my tensor with something that's zero at a particular point. Now, and also the problem is that because I defined, uh, the, I'm uh, taking closures everywhere, yeah. it, you could have things like something sitting at a generic point, tensor something sitting at a special point is zero despite the fact that there is non trivial So, So there are some uh, silly reasons why this could be a strict inclusion, but. Essentially, it's supposed to be a <laughs> quote. Okay. All right. And so, now one reason why, actually let me mention another thing, that, uh, so before this talk I discussed a special example where there was this scheme given by the equation zero equals zero, or a bunch of equations zero. So it's a system of equations, it's not a single equation. Now this actually turns out to be uh, somehow helpful. So an example, because there's the, we always have the following example. So if you have a, so suppose you have a complete intersection, so you start with S, and then you write a bunch of uh, equations on S. And suppose you want to, suppose you have a specific point in this complete intersection. Well, take this point inside S <coughs> and impose the same equations now on this point. So take now the zero locus of this point, which will be now all these equations, because at this point was assumed to lie in z, all of these equations will actually be equal to zero. So if I take the, uh, so if I take the cross product, the fiber product, this will be, this will look exactly like the example I considered earlier. And moreover, <coughs> because now I got a map from the example considered uh, before to any local complete intersection. And in fact, the map itself is obtained by base change from the embedding from a point into something smooth, and this embedding is local complete intersection. So this map is LCI. And we saw that if you have an LCI map, there are some very nice properties of functoriality for pullback, for singular support with respect to pullback. So this means that our, and we understand singular support here very well, that's what the point of the example earlier. So we can now somehow use this to, 
compute, I guess, singular support of something at a point by somehow taking its restriction to this DG point and looking at the singular support there. So this, exa so this example uh, with Kazul duality, it wasn't just, mm, I, it, it doesn't just help understand uh, behavior in general, it also can be used to, in fact, measure it in general. So this is, so we can use functoriality Mm, well, for singular support, I guess, with respect to upper shriek, to somehow reduce general notion of singular support to something in this Kazoo picture, to simplify. So, Okay, now, now let me get back to this general setting. So the other reason why I was interested in this uh, particular case of smooth morphism is, is because it shows that all these singular notions that we considered, this notion of sing of z, uh, this notion of singular support of a sheaf on z, of incoherent sheaf on z, are act they're actually local in smooth topology. So this allows us to extend them immediately, not just to schemes, but in fact to stacks, and which is good news because it's stacks we are after. So it's namely the stack of local systems. So <coughs> this functoriality or rather, I guess, smooth, so <coughs> singular support is now shown to be a smooth local, so can be defined on stacks. Notice that I want uh, to be able to pass, so because I'm only talking about smooth locality, I need my stacks to be covered to have a smooth cover by schemes. So these are not this f uh, general fancy pre-stacks that might appear. These are actually, I want to say art in stacks, well maybe I should say art in DG stacks, so they might have some DG structure, but uh, they should be uh, representable, there should be a smooth presentation by a DG scheme. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, those will, I mean, you can define, you, this, the point is somehow that they are actually geometric stacks and in fact that they are complete intersection stacks. So this is the point I was trying to make. The ones we are interested in are actually one stack, so we don't have to worry about this. So, so I will just say Artin. So I guess Artin stacks means that they are one stacks. Artin DG stacks. And in fact, I have to assume that they are complete intersection, local complete intersections. And um, let me just mention something that might be a little bit misleading. So let Z fancy Z be a stack. Then, then this category of incoherent sheaves on Z. Well, it's not important, but Artin has no G. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was, <laughs> well, uh, to my, yes. That was Artin migrate and G was migrate <laughs> from DG. I'm sorry for this. <laughs> No, but I, I really appreciate it. I would hate to have this on the board for longer than a minute. So, mm, okay, good. So uh, this is 
So this is, um, mind you, this is defined to be as some, as, uh, some kind of limit. I don't know, we can, I guess I can just write this and remember that it's limit and not a co-limit. Uh, uh, so limit of int co of z, where in this case I can consider just smooth covers. So smooth. Uh, so I can consider the category of uh, smooth, uh, just smooth topology on Z, if you like, uh, where Z itself is a scheme. And I want to say that, uh, so a word of caution is that uh, now. And the limit is, of course, used using F apostrophe. Yes. Although I would, I can only, uh, let me only consider smooth maps between smooth covers, then there is no really. <coughs> so if I want, because, because I'm assuming that my stack is actually a nice stack, I can restrict myself to smooth covers and to smooth maps between smooth covers. I so I can actually, I yes, really so, so I can really twist, it doesn't really matter which one I use. But philosophically, it's better to use Shriek. Really gluing, but, but you do well, this is gluing. Yes, that's, this is gluing. I mean, if you try writing what explicitly what this happens in this limit, this is exactly like if you have one scheme, then you have another scheme, and then you have a third scheme mapping to both, then your objects should be identified on this. So this limit is a way to write gluing. But I want to mention that here we're treating this int core as a single symbol. So at least in this line, there is no statement that this is the int completion of the category of coherent sheaves on Z. So there is no claim that this category is finitely generated, uh, I mean compactly generated by Koch Z. So this is correct? Yeah, this is the definition. This is under weak assumptions on Z, something like uh, quasi-compact, semi-separated. So under weak assumptions, it's actually true that, say, int core z is compactly generated by core z. But I suggest to forget about this fact for now, because uh, we are also interested in smaller categories, say, in the category of quasi-coherent shifts on z, where this uh, is not known. So it's not known what happens when we. It's not known where the quasi-coherent shift uh, is. Of, uh, I mean, it's not known I, where would uh, suppose uh, wh where would perfect <coughs> sheaves on a stack come from? How do you know that there are sufficiently many? I mean, even proving that there are sufficiently many perfect complexes on a I shouldn't call them sheaves perfect complexes on the schemes is requires the trick. So, but this trick is very schematic. It's about looking at the intersections of actual open sets. So, on a s on stack, this generally speaking is this is not available. Yeah. <coughs> okay, but so, so after saying this, let me just mention that now we can define this thing fancy Z, which is it sits over. Well, I guess it actually sits over the classical part of the stack Z, so we don't care about the DG world. And, um, and in fact, uh, so this, this is defined and it uh, can be obtained by gluing all the different things of this. So it can be defined locally in smooth topology. Um, or you can define it in one step using the, con the more natural constructions discussed last time. Yesterday. You mean yes. So, but at any rate, there is this. So let me just draw the diagram. So there's over Z classical, there's sing of Z, which maps here. And then if you have a smooth map, I mean, it's smooth um, map from Z to fancy z, but smooth does not mess up with the classical part. 
So this sits here, this sits here, this sing normal sin z sits here. Uh, that non dg, the h naught. So somehow that, because smooth in particular include means that it's in particular non dg, it does not mess. That. So, so this whole thing is Cartesian. And, <coughs> and now if we have f, if there's a f an incoherent sheaf, we can associate to it a Why is it, oh, that, that this is because this is cat shifted cotangent complex. So the, these, oh, the cotangent complex will only differ in degree zero, and that's not what affects sing. So this is, that, this is why sing was actually local in smooth topology. So, so we have this kind of diagram, and finally, so the int coherent sheaves, so if I now have an incoherent sheaf on Z. Hmm? So the right hand side Z is just a next of kin, right? Yes. So it's what's the difference between Z and Z classical over there? No, but it might be a DG scheme. Ah, it's DG scheme. Not DG tech, yes. Scheme. Yes. And now if I have an incoherent sheaf on uh, on the stack, then I can define its singular support. And the easiest way, so it will be a subset, a conical subset here, so conical. And the easiest way to define it is by gluing um, singular supports of various pullbacks. So if this map is, say, P for uh, singular supports of P upper shriek of F, or upper star if you prefer. And, and then uh, the functoriality of singular support tells us that these conical subsets will indeed glue. So, sorry, what, so what, what kind of object is the thing uh, functioning? This thing? Well, the easiest thing is that it's a scheme. Uh, it's, uh, it's another stack, but it's schematic over this one. So if you change base to a scheme, it's a scheme again. Yeah. What kind of object is the singular support? It's a, oh, this, oh, you mean this? Yeah. It's a, well, I'm saying it's a conical subset. So I'm only interested in a, it's a, it's a risky closed subset. Now, if you don't like using the word subset of a stack, but now you can just talk about points, then you can ag agree to equip it with, say, reduced scheme structure. It seems a little arbitrary, but. But again, it's, it's the risky closed conical subset in this. So there's an action of the multiplicative group by dilations along the fibers of the, this projection. And we can see the closed subsets that are invariant under this, um, under this action. Well, again, since I'm assuming that it's uh, everything is has smooth, so this is like a normal stack. I don't have to. I and mean, there is a you can say some general words, but in this case, you can also just say take a presentation of your stack and take classical part of that. Okay. Uh, okay, so can I, uh, now, so this is a general, <coughs> this is all general statements. Now, <coughs> the most important application So important ap 
application. And for us, maybe the most important application in, in this categorical Langlands conjecture. So where the stack Z is the stack of local systems. This is the stack uh, discussed in the tutorial yesterday. And I also explained why it's, uh, uh, why it's a locally complete intersection. And I also essentially computed its thing, although I didn't use these words because I didn't talk about it. we didn't have these words available at that point. But let me remind you that, so what is this thing of Z is supposed to be? It's supposed to be basically um, what? In, let me just write things very informally. It's supposed to be a bundle with a connection, that is to say a point of log C's. And notice that here I'm, I'm allowed to consider this classically. So it, and an element in the shifted cotangent bundle. So this is A sitting in H minus 1 of the cotangent bundle to um, T star T nabla log cis G. Maybe let me use capital A here for reasons that will should become apparent in a moment. So we can now... So this was computed last time. I guess I computed the tangent bundle. So this is the dual to the first cohomology of the tangent complex. And last time I told you that no matter how we think about these local systems, the tangent complex is just the shifted Dirac complex. So this first cohomology, <coughs> let me, I think that deserves its own board, at least part of the board. So this H1, so this was computed yesterday. Not much of a computation, it was stated, I guess, yesterday. That this is actually uh, well, shifted Dirac homology, which leads to this being the second Dirac homology of X, <coughs> with coefficients in the twist of the Lie algebra by P. Now, well, Now I'm supposed to dualize this. So did I? I I'm somehow worried that I'm uh, at some point uh, use the fact that my Lie algebra is reductive. Well, maybe I maybe I'm allowed to do this. This so f f anyway. So I was going to say that now this the cotangent bundle to this. No. Oh, okay. Will still makes sense. So I'm supposed to take the dual of this. And this is going to be zeros, the Ramka homology, of the twist of the cotangent uh, of the, uh, well, coadjoint action, so the twist of the dual of the Lie algebra G by P. So in other words, these are just horizontal sections of this uh, bundle with connections. So these are horizontal sections. Now, if G is reductive, which uh, the more, this is the most important case for the geometric Langlands conjecture, uh, then it's Lie, uh, there's an invariant scalar product on the Lie algebra, and so this can be identified with the original adjoint P. I'm saying one thing and then writing, I guess that covers all the bases. So <laughs> one of those statements had to be correct. So then um, this is simply a horizontal, I guess, an infinitesimal symmetry 
of so an infinitesimal symmetry of my uh, uh, bundle with connection. So this is what this sing uh, this shifted cotangent bundle looks like when um, uh, 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 what this is what this construction gives when applied to the stack of local systems. It's a triple local, well, well, there's a local system, and then there's an infinitesimal <coughs> symmetry of this local system, which is like a horizontal twisted section of the Lie algebra. Why do I want this? Well, I don't have to, but in the moment I will say something like let's look at nilpotent elements here which uh, I mean it's clear that this notion of nilpotence does not depend on the identification but somehow it's psychologically easier to yeah, use this. How general is, this? Uh, so how general so is so what? So you're saying that here I mean seeing Z where Z is locked and identified with the pairs of an element and uh, uh, that's in the Lie algebra always stabilized. Uh, well, up to duality. So this this last step depended on G being reductive. No, I understand, but uh, is there a class of sets uh, such as log T? Like, I mean, more general class but of sets? Yeah, they're called symplectic. So, I mean, this is really just using the pairing between H2 and uh, between the second, uh, between one, uh, one of those things you described is the minus first cohomology of the tangent space. The other one is the f first cohomology of the tangent space. And the pairing between the two is exactly the symplectic the form. This, uh, symplecticity? The symplecticity is just a, f well, this, the, uh, it's another way of thinking about this identification. You don't have to think about it this way. Yes. Yes, yes. Which is probably imprecise, right? But if classically I think I'm allowed to do this, and this, remember here, I, I don't care about DG stuff. Ah, uh -huh. So okay. so I think, I, I think here I'm safe. OK, so, so again, so let me just write this. So that this sing, uh, sorry, sing of local systems is the triples p nabla a, where this p and nabla is in log cis. Technically, I should be writing, I guess, classical part of the log cis. And a is a section, a horizontal section of the adjoint. Uh, so horizontal infinitesimal symmetry. Now let me put, finally, I, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> running over, I, but I want to get to the statement. So let me now put, let me call the nilpotent, uh, global nilpotent cone by definition to be the subset in this shifted cotangent bundle consisting of all triples with nilpotent A. <coughs> this, it's easy to see that this makes sense. I mean, the twist doesn't uh, bother us about because nilpotence is conjugacy invariant. And because the f since A is supposed to be horizontal, it's easy to see that nilpotence at a all points are equivalent. So it's a it's like if you have a, in down to earth terms, I'm saying that if you have a, a vector bundle with a connection, and then if you have an endomor a horizontal endomorphism, then it's either nilpotent at all points or it's not nilpotent at all points. And so, so the uh, big conjecture, somehow the corrected version of the geometric Langlands conjecture, it was.
So the correction <coughs> consists of, well, there's a category. I don't remember which side was on the right, which one was on the left before. So there was the, I'm not going to touch the geometric side, but on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Galois side, instead of looking at, so originally we had this, this category for the dual group G, that's not good. So you can also try putting int core here, but that will turn out to be too large. And so the, what we put inside is the, somehow the category of sheaves with singular support in this set. So this notion of singular support allows us to cut out a category sitting bes between um, between this and this. Namely, it's the category of int coherent sheaves. It's yeah, it's a full subcategory in the category of incoherent sheaves consisting of those whose sup singular support lies in the global important cone. I think I was supposed to put global here rather than cone. I don't know why I put cone. It's again, so I think this is the notation we are using. Let me put it global. All right, and so, so it's like if we consider, this is like saying we consider things whose singular support is unrestricted, could be entire this thing. Quasi-coherent sheaves mean that the singular support is, has to be the zero section, that is the condition that A must be zero. Now we uh, find something in between them where we, A is required to be nilpotent, and this is the suggested form of the conjecture. Thank you. Yes. How do you get that it's an important that you have to say this? Well, by, <laughs> of course, there's more to say here. I d didn't just come out with this randomly. So there are certain consistency checks where the nilpotence condition naturally appears. There are some compatibility with Eisenstein series where this appears. There is a compatibility with Sataki equivalence where this appears. And you can also actually yeah, check, yeah. what? I, I cannot yeah. hear what you say. He's saying that for GLA, you know that in GLA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do I know? For, for you, mean, you mean that some kind of, okay. Anyway, and you can also ch check, this, check that these two categories are of the same size if it's P1, <coughs> if for in Gino zero. Well, I mean, they are isomorphic, they are equivalent, but it's not clear that the equivalence, this is essentially Laforgue's, cal Vincent Laforgue's calculation. It's not obvious that this uh, equivalence agrees with all of the, it satisfies all of the compatibilities. That's why I didn't call it just geometric Langlands conjecture if G is equal to zero, but it matches all the, it has all the signs of being there. Genus. If the curve is P1. For GL1, is there any For GL1, there are no nilpotent. So this is why last, uh, yesterday when I was talking about geometric class field theory, these incoherent sheaves did not play a role. This is because uh, for GL1, even though uh, this is a, um, this thing is um, non-trivial, so it is actually uh, not smooth, so there, is, there are some DG directions, the nilpotence condition forces us to somehow this category coincides with quasi-core. But this is the only case where this happens. Other questions? Well, the question is, you have to make sense of skyscraper sheaves. So at some points, it's at smooth points, it's easy, but those are somehow the least interesting ones. So the point is that this, if you just take skyscraper sheaf as a 
uh, sheaf in um, as a coherent sheaf, its singular support will be as large as possible. So it will not satisfy this null potence condition. So it's not in this category. And you have to somehow force it into this category first, and that's not a very natural operation. So this, this is somehow why uh, Hecke Eigen sheaves corresponding to, um, which I presume that was somehow the direction that you were going, which is why Hecke Eigen sheaves corresponding to singular points, not just singular, but points where uh, there are nil potent endomorphisms. At those points, you, you, uh, uh, something non trivial happens. So this is cons this is one of the consistency checks. So well, I think that that's exactly like saying that nilpotent endomorphisms, uh, that not all endomorphisms are nilpotent. Okay. So. So. Uh, But scalar is an exceptional case. So technically, the skyscraper. <laughs> uh, no, but when you are talking about scalars, uh, when you are uh, talking about scalars, this technically the skyscraper shift on, uh, uh, say, uh, so suppose you have suppose G is GM. Technically, if you take the naive definition of the skyscraper shift at a point, it will not be perfect. Because there is some DG direct there are some DG directions and this thing does not. So this is like in this example, uh, in the example with the Kazul correspondence, when I was looking at the this just field K as a module over K of Xi. So it's consistent this example is consistent with what I said. Yes, but you can see, but not those. It included different sheaves. So you're not supposed to apply it. So you see, I mean, there is this, uh, in, for GM, there was log C is GM in the DG sense, and there was the log C is GM in the classical sense. Now, of course, Generally speaking, I'm supposed to uh, write this arrow in the um, opposite direction. <laughs> but in this case, actually, it splits, so I can write it like this. So normally, with the things that you are thinking about are skyscraper sheaves here. This is a smooth thing, so these skyscraper sheaves are um, perfect. So if I want, I can now pull them back here. They will no longer be technically skyscraper sheaves because they will leave along, there are some <coughs> DG directions along this line. So these are the things that we u normally consider when we're talking about the uh, Langlands. If you take a point, <coughs> take a point, if you're collapsing the point, then you have to find space that you will automatically uh, okay. follow all that is in the image in, in, in your category. What is I don't think it's in my, I mean, <coughs> I mean, I believe that this is actually this is this is exactly. It's not this phenomenon that you get uh, large uh, singular support for skyscraper sheaf. It's not related to the automorphisms. Dispo it's the fact that it's related to automorphisms is misleading because we're using symplectic structure here. It's related to the singularities of your of the stack, to the fact that it's. So, so somehow I think that if you if you're trying to cure this by looking at a map from a point to point mod G, that's not going to help because this is not dealing with the problem. This is dealing with uh, with automorphisms, which which is not the issue. Here. I'm. Depend what which ones are the correct or the. The ones that will be in important would be the pullbacks. They have to be, yes. And they would be different from the example that we saw before with uh, the points. Yes, because I mean the fiber of this map, 
looks like exactly this spec of this uh, derived dual numbers object. So the fiber, so over a particular point, there's a point and this spec k at is sitting over it. So you pull back, you get free module over this. And not k. So that's, that's the point. The free, the free module is, of course, in the um, perfect category. It's as good, it's in quasi-core, so it's easy to work with, but it's not really the skyscraper sheaf. And notice that it depended on splitting of this map anyways. Yes, but again, in, in some sense, if you, yeah, th this means that if you look at it very, very carefully, you should be able to tell that it's not completely canonical. So, but uh, this is, <laughs> the question is, uh, so suppose we look at the geometric class field theory. Then the best we can close is we're not allowed to consider skyscraper sheaf of a point because that's not perfect. So the closest we can get to it, on the other hand, there are classically defined um, objects. Uh, so how are they defined? You can say that they are defined by taking this guy, by uh, reversing somehow the map from the classical uh, stack of local. So normally you would have the classical stack of local systems sitting here. Now, if you're working with GM, you can reverse this arrow. Uh, not canonically. So because this guy is actually, but I think now that I'm starting to answer, uh, starting to tell you, I actually know the answer. So you can reverse this arrow and then you can take a skyscraper sheaf at this point and then pull it back. This is the closest we can get. But this is not quite, not 100% canonical. So somehow its invariance properties under the Hecke functors should be, um, Somehow its invariance properties under the Hecke functors should not be exactly um, as natural as, as, say, for an irreducible local system over SL2. So what as, how do you see this? So this map is canonical. How is this map canonical? I mean, you just forget the distraction. No, but this is the map in the opposite direction. No, we can we can attach Hecke eigenshifts to this, yes. but then because it does not sit at a point. These are not this this does not sit at a single point. Okay, but should we wrap up the discussion and then continue this privately? <laughs> Can we have a break? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, is it the end of the lecture? Yes, that's the end of the The lecture is over. Yeah, so, hey. so the perspective is very important. Let's, let's have a break and then discuss QNA. Okay. QNA. But break should be non zero, should be more than zero. <laughs> okay, 15 minutes. Okay.